to adapt to the changes in their life. If someone you know suffers from changeitis, make sure they get treatment before it becomes full-blown, stuck-in-a-rut-osis. We love change. How many here, by the way, you, you really struggle with, uh, with change in your life? Would you raise your hand? Only a few of you. How many here love it? Yeah, well, it all depends on what kind. Yeah. Good change, yeah. Bad change, sometimes it's tough. Change is tough. And we live in a world where we are bombarded every day, whether we like it or not. Uh, we live where, the, where there's a constant series of changing in our lives. And, you know, I've come to the conclusion that that uh, the reason why people don't like change is because most of us are control freaks, right? If you're a control freak, would you, would you raise your hand? Or are you controlling? Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, control freaks don't like change because they can't, they can't control that change. And, and so the less change, the less con, you know, the more I can control. And, and so, but we, but we live in a time when, when change is probably happening fast, happening faster uh, than ever before. Uh, but here's the key. Here's the key. The key is to place uncontrollable change into God's unchangeable hand. Now, here's how fast change happened to you this week. How many here have children that went to school this week? I mean, if you, all you got to do is look at Facebook, you know. People are crying. You can tell they're crying. You know, my kids going. How many here uh, have you have you have a child or young person that entered into high school this year? Would you raise your hand? Anybody? Yeah, I I uh, have. Listen, I now have. This is this is how crazy my life is. World is. I now have three, not children, grandchildren that are in high school grandchildren and i have and i have now three grandchildren that enter middle school <laughs> how many here and then i have one grandchild who starts kindergarten next week right next week I, i'm telling you you know change happens so fast i remember when all of these kids were just little and that kid too. So <laughs> say, hey, mom, I understand, okay? <laughs> uh, but kid, you know, ch they change, and 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 when they do, we we don't know how to deal with that change in our lives. We don't know how to deal with those things that are going on in our lives. You know, I can remember. You know, when I was a kid, I shared this with you before. You know what, what kind of computer I had? I had an Etch a Sketch. You know what that is, <laughs> right? You know, you you. I, one child just looked at his mom, what's the next <laughs> You know, it's, you know, where you have those two knobs and you write things, and when you don't like what's on there, you just flip it over and shake it, right? And it goes away. So I've, we've, I've moved from an Etch-a-Sketch to an iPhone. I have an iPhone. I moved from, get this, how many here remember this? A, a Commodore 64, okay? <laughs> how many? I did my messages years ago in Pennsylvania. I used to do my messages on a Commodore 64, and then you'd print them out, and that was fun. You'd print them out on this paper that they had, and, and you know, you get these kind of computer letters. You, you didn't have any, you had one font, and I don't know what it was, but you, but you had it, and, and then you'd have to tear off the paper, and, and then I'd have all my message notes and all that. You couldn't hardly see them, but anyway, uh, so we've moved along. How many here, I'm going to really date you now, how many here... Uh, remember when there was just black and white TV? All right. <laughs> okay. Hey, I remember as a kid, my, we only had black and white TV, and you could only get three channels. You know, ABC, NBC, CBS, that was it. And oh, then there was a local one, which I watched my favorite show, Captain Zero. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, we had black and white TV, and remember when The Wizard of Oz came out in color? You know? I begged my neighbor had, my neighbor had color, they moved up. We never moved up with everybody else. We kind of stayed. And I, I begged my mom, please let me go next door and watch The Wizard of Oz, you know, in color. And I don't know if she let me go or not. But I, uh, 
But, but things are changing. And, and i got to tell you something. This is tough for me. This year, and I've shared this with you already, but this year in November, I will be <laughs> 60 years old. <laughs> Can you? 60 stinking. Well, I remember when I was a kid, that was ancient. And, and, and uh, so to hit 60 years old is, is kind of scary. Uh, let me show you a picture of when I was 16. All right. <laughs> Like, a, like those pants? Huh? <laughs> yeah, look how happy Robin is to be with me. You know, <laughs> that was a wonderful night. But, <laughs> but, you know, things are just changing so fast and we don't know what to do. And, and here's, the, here's the deal, folks. When things change so fast, it's important to know that God doesn't change. Now, what does that mean? What does that mean God doesn't change? It means that, that although God produces and, I mean, you know, He allows and, and, and directs change, He never changes. What I mean by that is His character never changes. His truth never changes. The attributes of God never change. He is always, and all, He has always been and always will be omnipotent. That means He's all-powerful. Omniscient, that means He's all-knowing omnipresent that means he's everywhere at once there are certain things about god that in the midst of a changing fast-paced moving changing world god doesn't change and what's important for us to understand that as this world moves at a rapid pace it's important for us to understand that we need to hold on to him we need to hold on to a, a, a... In fact, the Bible says this about, about Jesus Christ in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. Would you read this with me? Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. He's the same. His character doesn't change. You see, if we are obedient to God, no matter what happens around us, God's Spirit will work within us. In the midst of a world that's so uncertain, you can, re you can rest on the certainty of Almighty God in your life. You know, one of the, uh, one of the Bible characters who experienced great change in his life was, um, was Moses. Moses was a guy who was born into royalty. He was born into the Egyptian palace. He was, he was tutored under Pharaoh's uh, authority. And one day he decided that he was tired of the way the Egyptians were treating his people. And because the Egyptian had, had severely beaten one of his people, he killed this Egyptian, buried him. And when it was found out about and was exposed, Pharaoh wanted to kill Moses. So Moses took off. And Moses simply said, you know, I just, I just want to get away from all of this world. And he, and, and he ran to a place called Midian. And there, what he wanted to do is just kind of say, oh, you ever want to do that? I never understood my dad till today when he used to say, when I, when I was a kid, I remember him say, he says, all I want to do is go to a mountain, live in a shack with my dog. <laughs> you know, um, I didn't understand that then, but I do understand that now. I understand that the pressures of life, just we sometimes... We, like, like the Southwest commercial, you know, don't you just want to get away? <laughs> you just kind of move away from things. And, but, but Moses, he was a guy who, 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 he secluded himself in this place called Midian. Then he got married, okay? Then he settled down and he looked forward to a, a great life in Midian where he would tend sheep, take care of his father's sheep, uh, excuse me, father-in-law's sheep, and um, just watch the sheep and watch the grass grow. I heard a guy one time, I was in North Carolina, I was in a coffee shop. And uh, he said, all I want to do is just sit around and watch the grass grow. Why would you want to do that? But anyway, that, I heard one guy say, all I want to do is sit around and watch nails rust. You know, what they're saying, I, don't want to, I just kind of want to, I, I want to veg out the rest of my life. But Moses thought that. He, he knew that uh, they were hunting his head and they knew that Pharaoh wanted to kill him, but he said, hey, I can just kind of chill here 
until one day God does something in his life. God brings what I call holy interruptions. Ever happened to you? You're going along. In fact, you might even think you're serving God and you're honoring God and He's right there where I need Him to be and, and, and I'm going to... God's just... you are kind of got this spiritual momentum in your life and then God abruptly interrupts you with a holy interruption. He just stops you right where you are. And the way that you thought you were going to go and the life that you thought you were going to live changed abruptly. I like to say it this way. God loves to take. Now let me put it this way. So it's right. Oh, God's interruptions turns into great spiritual eruption. What, what we think is an inconvenience or what we think is an interruption or what we think is something that we just, you know, just kind of gets in our way is what God uses to direct us and to show us where He wants us to go. So in Exodus chapter 3, you, you may be familiar with the story. In the first service, I said Moses chapter 3, and people are looking for, where is that in the Bible? You know. But uh, there is no book of Moses, okay? It's in Exodus chapter 3. By the way, let, let me just say something about the Word of God. This, this is just kind of, this is for free, okay? Um, we live in a country, we live in a world that was founded on biblical principles. But now we live in a world where people don't even know what the Bible says. And so God has led me to go through different books of the Bible. This whole year, we're going through the book of Acts. Here's what's going to happen in your life if you'll stay with us. Even if you miss a few, you can get them online, that kind of thing. But you will get an understanding of where the church, God's church, began, grew, was persecuted, tested where it came from. And you will understand through the book of Acts how the church is supposed to act. What the church is supposed to be. What is she supposed to do? We are the body of Christ. And what does that look like? And you would not understand that if you don't read the book of Acts. And so it's my desire that we live in a world, even in our churches today, folks, listen, where they are biblically illiterate. And so I want to encourage you if, you, if you're not reading your Bible because somebody told you it's too hard to understand, or somebody told you that's just for the preacher to do, I'm telling you, you are missing out on God's life because God's life is found in God's Word. And so I want to encourage you to begin reading your Bible. You know, read the New Testament. If you, if you look at the Old Testament, it scares you, it shouldn't, but... But if you, until you can understand its context, and you can over time, and we make a promise to you here that we will, we will teach and preach the Word of God. And if you've got questions, we want this to be a safe place to ask tough questions. So Moses, he's ready to just kind of chill for the rest of his life in Midian. And in, and in Exodus chapter 3, it says this, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb. Now you might read that, you might think that's just a place. It goes on to say the mountain of God. That's the place where God showed up in Moses' life in a powerful way. And Moses didn't know, I don't think he had a clue what Horeb meant to, meant to God at that point. I think he just kind of was out, you know, with the sheep grazing, and God, God has a way of leading us to places we don't know where He's leading us, and He He leads them to this this profound place called the Mount uh, Mount, uh, Mount Horeb, the mountain of God. There in a, there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Now Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought. <laughs> And some of you may think the same thing if you saw this. I will go over and see this strange sight. <laughs> Whatever is it, you know? Why the bush does not burn up. Now, one thing I learned when we camp in North Carolina, we got to buy a lot of firewood. You know why? Because the wood burns up, you know. And so we, we bring the firewood and we, and, we, and, and we burn it up and we got to go out and get more. And, 
uh, but Moses was looking at this bush and it was, it was on fire, but it wasn't burning up. And verse 4 says, When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, at the, to look God called him from the, within the bush. Boy, that'd freak you out, wouldn't it? You're looking at this bush that won't burn, but it's on fire, and then God speaks. Moses, Moses, as Moses said, here I am. He's looking, at it, here I am. Do not, and I love this part. In other words, God's about to say, you're, you're in store for a holy interruption. This is an important moment in your life. And God says this, do not come any closer. God said, take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. You ever been there? You ever been to that place where God says, I'm about to do something in your life. You need to listen. In fact, you need to take off your shoes. This is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers. And I am concerned about their suffering. So Moses is probably thinking, God, that's great. I understand because I, am, I love my people too. But why are you telling me? Why, why am I here? Well, he, he, he will tell them that. He says, so I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of that land into a good, uh, a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. The home of the, of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and, the, and all the parasites and Ivites or whatever, you know, Hivites and Jebusites. And he says, and now the cry of the Israelites has reached me and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now, go. And I can imagine he said, who? <laughs> you know, He says, go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Very holy moment that God calls and gives this holy interruption and says, and says I'm going to change your life. But you can rest. In fact, when you read on down, you'll find out he says, well, who do I say sent me? He says, I am that I am. In other words, the God that always was, the unchangeable God who has always been, will be there as you go through this highly changeable time in your life. You know, that's true for Moses, but that's true for you too. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know, what, I don't know if you're going through something bad or something good, something painful or something exciting. Either way, you and I both need this unchangeable God to guide us and direct us. Moses needed that. Well, let's flip over to the book of Acts. Because in the book of Acts, God is doing a change in Peter. And the purpose of God doing a change in Peter is that he would so change the way he views the church he would so change the way that he views the gospel and who, is it, who it's to go to that, that he wants to say, okay, now we're moving into a different era. And so God begins to change not only Peter, but he begins to change a guy by the name of Cornelius. And they come together with what I call colliding visions. And these visions are in sync. And God says, I want to reach not just the Jewish people, not just the Samaritans, not just those who live in Judea, but also those who live throughout the world. Acts 1.8, kind of the foundation of the whole book, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. That word witnesses is where we get our word martyr from. You will be my martyrs. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. I am going to, to give you a holy interruption here. And you're going to move in an area that you thought you never would have to move. You know, the Jerusalem church is one thing to 
And that was a big step to trust Jesus as the Messiah and move out of Judaism into following Jesus Christ. It's another thing to step into a group of people or reach a group of people that you've been taught to despise. In Acts chapter 11, verse 1, Again, it's one thing to experience, by the way, it's one thing to experience something. It's another thing to explain that experience, isn't it? How many of you here, God just worked in your life. He's touched your heart. He's done a work in you that only he can do. And you know it. You not only know it, you feel it and you're excited about it. But now you got to explain it. That gets scary sometimes. It's one thing to know what Christ has done inside of me. It's another thing to share with my neighbor about it. Share with someone else about it. Well, in Acts chapter 11, here's what he says. The apostles and the believers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of the Lord. Now notice what happened. Gentiles are now hearing the gospel, okay? So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers... That, that's the Jewish believers. Read this next part with me. Criticized him. Wait a minute. This is just for us. It's just for us more and no, it's us for no more kind of thing. You know? So he says he, they criticized him and said, you went to the house of the uncircumcised men and read this next part with me, will you? And, and wait a minute. You had the audacity to go to these people and not only talk to them, which is, is not a good thing, but we, <laughs> you, you ate dinner with them, which was a sign of intimacy, a sign of closeness, a sign of connection. By the way, I'm, I didn't say this in the first service. It just kind of hit me now. One of the things I want us to reinstitute in our homes is a time of eating together. Not in front of a television. There is power in that. The Bible clearly talks about the power that comes with sitting down. He says to the church of Laodicea, the church that's kind of nonchalant and, and, and they, they, they're kind of doing their own thing. He says, you're lukewarm, so, I, so I'll spit you out of my mouth. He says at the end of this, I stand at the door and knock, and if you will let me in, here's what he says, I will eat with you. We will have this kind of intimate conversation. I want to encourage you, if you're not doing that, Carve out that time for you and your family where you'll pray together. Maybe we'll work on some kind of devotion to help out there. But we come together with our family and we begin to just see God. So this sign of, of when Peter and, and goes to these Gentiles and he begins to eat with them, that's offensive to many Jews. I just want you to know that. And, it goes on to, and, and he goes on to say this. He says, and I love what he does here. Verse 4, starting from when? The beginning, okay, that's a good place to start. Peter told them the whole story. Here's what he says. We've heard it, we, we read it a few weeks ago, but we're going to cover it real quickly again. He says, I was in the city of Joppa praying. I, mean, I was seeking God. I don't know what he wants me to do, but I know I'm ready to do what he wants, okay? I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in, the, in a trance I saw a vision. I saw something large like like a large sheet being let down from heaven by its four corners. Can you imagine? Now, now try to picture this now, okay? This big sheet that's let down from heaven, all four corners of the sheet came down to where I was. I looked, I looked into it and I saw four-footed animals uh, of the earth, wild beasts, reptiles, and birds. So, so these, it's believed that what he saw was just unclean. Uh, what animals that they were considered at that time unclean. And, and it says, Then I heard a voice telling me, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. Verse 8, I replied, Surely not, Lord, nothing impure or unclean has ever entered my mouth. You know, I'm a good Jewish guy. I, I, I do the right things. I eat the right foods. I've honored your, your, your laws. I, and he says, The voice spoke from heaven a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. He says, I'm about to change the way you think. 
I'm the same God who instituted the laws, the ceremonial laws and the ritual laws back in the Old Testament for a reason, but now I'm about to change not the truth, but some of those dietary laws because I want you to reach a people that you've never reached before. He says, I replied, uh, verse 9, excuse me, the voice spoke, uh, verse 10. This happened three times, and then it was all pulled up to heaven again. Verse 11. Right then, three men who had been sent to me from Caesarea stopped at the house where I was staying. Look at verse 12. This is so important. Read this with me. Just the first four words. Here we go. The Spirit told me. In other words, no, I would, I'd do the rest. Hang on. I just, the Spirit told me. It's important to get, to have no hesitation about going with them. These six brothers also went with me, and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen an angel appear in his house and say, Send a Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. Verse 14. He will bring you a message through which you and all of your... Oh, no, read this last one. you got to get this one. If you don't get anything else, get this one. Look at verse 14. Here we go. Ready? Great enthusiasm. Ready? He will bring you a message through which you and all your household will be saved from your sin, from, your, from, from those things that separate you from God. Verse 15, as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them. You know, how... These people who we have despised over the years, these people who were unclean, these people who were unholy, these people, the move of God happened in their lives. The Holy Spirit came on them. And as he, as he, come, as he had come on us at the beginning, then I remembered what the Lord, read, read this man, what the what? What the Lord had said. This is significant here. Because, because as you know, in the New Testament church, especially in the book of Acts, they didn't have the Bible. <laughs> you didn't, in fact, chapters and verses in your Bible has been there for about 300 years. It just, and they didn't even have church letters yet. They had the Old Testament, and they had the teachings of Jesus. And what, what I want to bring to your attention is that Peter knew the teachings of Jesus. And it's important for us to understand that. That we, if it was important for him to know, we need to know what God has to say. And we learn what God has to say through study in his word. And so he says, the Lord had said, John baptized with water. So he was, he, John bat, would baptize what I call the baptism of repentance. You know, the Lord's coming, repent, he's getting ready to come. And his baptize, baptism was what I call a baptism of repentance. I baptize you with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. In other words, when, the, when, when, when God gets ready to build his church, John was saying, there's coming one who's greater than me and he will bring with him the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit descended in Acts chapter 2, that meant that they were baptized. And the word baptized means immersed with God's Spirit. We no longer have to go to a priest. We no longer have to go to somebody else. But we can come to God because God lives in us. The Holy Spirit lives in us. And then he goes on to say, so, I love this. He says, so if God gave them the same gift he gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, <laughs> here's what he's saying. If God gave us Jewish people and he gave the Gentiles this same gift, and read this next part with me, will you? Because this is great. Where, it's, where it says who, ready? Who was I to think that I could... In the way, who was I to think I could stand in God's way? I wonder how many of us get in God's way because we won't believe him, because we won't follow what he says, because we think maybe we can do a better, better job. And then read this last part with me, would you? When they heard this, come on, come on, help me out. Here we go. When they heard this, they had no further objections and praised God, saying, even Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to what? Life. God is now offering life 
to a group of people who have no life. They have an existence, but they have no life. And so Peter comes back to this ch his church leaders in Jeru Jerusalem and he says, God is doing something different. God is changing the way we think. This unchangeable God is changing the way we feel. It's changing what our responsibilities are. He's changing everything. And for us to get through this, we have one thing we need to do. Just simply, you know, if God says do it, who are we to argue? Would you agree with that? If God says go, who are we to do anything else but go? Now, I want you to get this. This is so important. And I think I even missed it in the first service. I shouldn't have. When God changes you, listen, when God changes you, He rearranges you. What I mean by that is that when God changes you and He brings you to be in His family, there's going to be all kinds of holy interruptions in your life. Interruptions that you didn't plan on. Interruptions that you'd rather not have. Interruptions that you would just as soon not be a part of. Interruptions that are going to be very inconvenient. Interruptions that aren't going to make a whole lot of sense. Because when God changes you, He'll never leave you like you are. But He rearranges you. And He does something in your life that only He can do. Don't allow the changes around us to affect the changes God's Spirit is doing within us. Now, so when you feel the change coming, here's I want you to I want you to, to, to focus on three things. When you feel the changes coming, do three things. Number one, get to know his word. Let me share a verse with you. Second Timothy two fifteen. Read this, would you? With me? Can you see the can you see it, Ed? You should have it memorized. But anyway, okay, here we go. <laughs> Just kidding. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. A worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. It's important that we understand the Bible in its context and we know how the King James puts it this way, rightly divide the word of truth. There are so listen, listen. All you got to do is turn on the TV to one of so, so some of these channels, and you're going to hear people use the Bible out of context. And you won't know that if you don't know the Bible. I'm not saying you need to be theologian, but there's some basic tenets of the faith that are clear. And you know, because the truth is, listen, I can make the Bible mean whatever I want. I know one guy says, you know, this is the way I'm going to learn the Bible. I'm just going to kind of open it up, and put my finger on it. Whatever I get, you know, is, is what I'm going to believe. And, and he opened his Bible and he put his finger down and said, Judas went and hanged himself. <laughs> he says, oh, that can't be right. So he closes and opens again and he points and says, go down and do likewise. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's what you're going to get. If you just kind of read the Bible randomly and you just kind of take what you... You can make the Bible mean whatever you want, but not in its context. It has a context. It has an interpretation. It's, you know, there might be a lot of different applications, but we need to understand what the Bible teaches. We, so why? So that we can rightly apply and divide the word of truth in our lives. The reason why Peter, when he heard this message and tried to explain it to these church leaders who were struggling with this new move was because he knew the words of Jesus. And he, and he saw how they became part of what this new mission called the church was about. Secondly, seek his face. Get to know His Word, but don't just be a student of the Word of God. You know, love the Word of God. Love the face of God. Seek His face. 
in, in, in Matthew 6, 33, powerful. In fact, I encourage you to, how many warriors do we have here? People worry? Would you raise, raise your hand, be honest, okay? You worry, uh, well, how am I going to? Read Matthew chapter 6. And here's what Jesus said. Would you read this with me? But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Now, what did he mean by that? Let me, let me paraphrase it. Seek God and his, his right, who He is. What He says is right. What His kingdom is. Seek Him, and here's a paraphrase, I'll take care of the rest. I'll take care of the stuff that you are worrying about all the time. But you've got to trust me. You've got to seek me. And then thirdly, and I already gave you this one, but I'll give it to you again. Obey His voice. Let, let me share a verse with you out of John chapter 10. This verse is where, where Jesus is speaking to his followers. And read this with me, would you? He says, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they, and they what? If you are in God's flock, if you are a part of God's family, you follow him. He says, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish no one will snatch them out of my hands. Here's what he's saying. When you're in my family, when you're a part of who I, who I am, you will have my direction, but you will have my protection. Where I lead, I will feed. Where I tell you to go, I will go with you. Now you say, you know, but Pastor Steve, I see Christians who struggle, persecute, all that. Listen, God sees us through eternal lenses. He doesn't see us through temporary situations. He understands that, that we're actually our 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 years on this planet is just a smidgen of the eternity that He has planned for us. Listen. God wants to do a work in your life. Um, I want to I give you a, um, a story that I've shared with you before, but it's a powerful story. Because I know, here's what I know about you. Most of you are going through some changes in your life. How many here in the last year you've just had a new child? Would you raise your hand, anybody? We've got a few of you here, okay? How many here in just the last year uh, had a tragedy in your life? You lost somebody you loved or just a difficult time? How many got married in the last year? Okay. I mean, all kinds, of, all kinds of changes are going on in your life. Some of them are good. But let me say this about change. Change isn't all bad. In fact, a lot of it's really good. Some of you maybe have been changed because maybe you got that job and you're making money you never made before. Or you got that promotion and, and, and the income that you have is greater than it used to be. And life is going pretty good. Or maybe, or maybe you got a windfall from something. How you deal with a change, whether it's prosperity or poverty, will determine where you're going to end up. It doesn't matter. I mean, sometimes the worst thing that can happen to people is prosperity. You know, prosperity without God isn't any better than poverty without God. It's not. In the end, um, there's a story about a guy who went out on his boat and decided to go out on this boat, and and he was, um, you know, he was just he had this new boat and he wanted to enjoy his boat, so he gets on his boat and he goes out. Well, he goes out quite a ways, and all of a sudden, a huge storm, unbeknownst to him, a huge storm came his way, and um, so the storm was so strong. That it, it just it, it hit with, with hurricane force winds hit his boat and capsized it and busted it all up and the next day they they didn't know where he was and so they went they, they you know they did a search but they found him they found him alive and he was clinging to this coral rock he was bruised battered bloody you know it was it wasn't a good picture but he was holding on to this coral rock. And they brought, they got him out. They rescued him. They cleaned him up and everything. And a reporter says, "I got to get this story." So he goes to this guy and he says, I, "I, I don't understand. How did you survive? 
because the storm, from our understanding, was like her, had hurricane force winds. How did you survive the waves and the winds and the, and, and the, the flying debris? You know, how did you make it? He says, well, he says, I found my way to this rock and I wrapped my arms around this rock. And as a storm went, and, and as a storm was just, just tossing me all over the place, throwing me around like a rag, he says, I clinged onto the rock. He says, but even though the storm was furious and I didn't know what to do, the rock never moved. The rock never moved. The storm moved me, but the rock never moved. I was tossed around, but I clung to the rock and it never moved. Listen, here's my point. In the midst of your in the midst of your change, regardless, good, bad, or, or, or whatever, in the midst, get this, in the midst of your holy interruptions, sometimes they feel unholy, huh, but interruptions, your responsibility, my responsibility, is to hold on to the rock who will guide you and walk with you and give you the strength no matter what comes your way, even when you feel like letting go. And you will. Let me give you the bottom line real quick. It's really important. When changes forcefully rage, to Christ fully engage. Say that with me if you would. When changes forcefully rage, to Christ fully engage. When changes forcefully rage, and they're going to come. I, I do weddings all the time. When I do weddings, one of the things I say to them is I say, when the storms of life come, and then I'll stop and say, I didn't say if. I said, when the storms of life. I did a wedding one time, and, uh, and they, we needed to hurry up because this, there was an outside wedding. Those are fun. You know, <laughs> outside wedding, and here comes the storm clouds in. I mean, dark cloud. And I said, I remember saying to this couple, I said, when the storm clouds come, when the storm comes in, you better have the right thing to hang on to. Because in your marriage, I guarantee you, I, it's not a maybe, I guarantee you're going to have storms. And see, when it's all said and done, when we look at our lives, the, the real question isn't, uh, did we go through tough times? It isn't, did we go through good times? It is, what do we hold on to through either one? What were we banking on? What were we betting on? What were we relying on? Well, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Would you bow your heads with me? Maybe you're here today and the Spirit of God is moving in your life. See, that's the neat thing about the New Testament. The Spirit of God is here. And He's moving in your heart. And He's moving in your life. And some of you here today are sensing something you never sensed before. You're sensing the moving of God's Spirit in your life, and He's calling you to Himself. You may have gone to church for a long time. You may have even been baptized. You may have gone through some kind of Christian class or confirmation. You might have, you might have been in church your entire life, but for the first time, the Spirit of God is calling you. And my encouragement to you right now is that you answer Him. And so I'm going to lead you in a prayer. It's not a magic prayer prayer okay there's nothing there's nothing magical about a prayer it's just hopefully to help you articulate what's going on in your mind and your heart say something like this to god say dear god i am a sinner i have fallen from your grace i have i have become i have become separated from you because of my sin forgive me of my sin I repent of my sin. In other words, I changed my mind about my sin. I changed my direction. And I want to follow Jesus Christ. I confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus. And I believe in my heart that God has raised him from the dead. And I surrender my life to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Look at me for just a minute, folks. If you just received Christ in your life, I mean really. 
then, then here's what I want you to do. In your program, there's a communication slip. Fill it out. Check. I'll tell you why I do this. Check where it says, Today I received Christ in my life. Take it to Craig in the back, and he'll give you a packet. And, and nobody will bug you. We won't come to your house. We won't, you know, it's not that kind of thing. We want you to grow because you've got a brand new life ahead of you. You've got a whole lot of changing that's going on, and we want to help you in any way that we can. Because God's Spirit wants to do a word work in your life. Maybe you're here today and you're a believer and you've pulled away. And today you need to come before Him and say, I surrender all. I come before you. You, you see, when we become followers of Christ, God owns us. The Bible tells us. He owns our mind. Do you realize that our, you know, we, we can't stop what comes into our minds, but we can stop what stays there, right? You know, can't stop a bird from flying over your head, but you can stop them from building a nest in your hair, right? So our thought life needs to go to Him. Some of you are beaten up by your thought life what you allow into it. And then, you know, your heart. You know, what, what are you, are you passionate about God anymore? Are you passionate about making money? Are you passionate about Jesus Christ? Are you passionate about stuff? You know, when we learn to say, okay, God, you're changing me and I'm going to go with the change that you're giving me. I'm going to hang on to you. And he begins to give us a new thought life a new passion, and then a new will. And maybe some of us, do, we just need to allow God to do what He needs to do. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to do a couple things here. So, so please don't leave, okay? Stay with me. This is just a couple minutes. We are about done, but you're not done, and I'm not done. They're, I'm praying that somebody will come because there's something in their lives they need to come and pray about. If that's you, this altar is open for you. But here's what I want you that are not coming to do. I want you to pray for them. This is, this is interactive service here. I want you to pray for those who come. I want you to pray, I want you to pray for those who should come and are. So, so please help. I'm going to go over here. I'm going to begin praying. And as we sing this time-honored song, all to Jesus I surrender. It never gets old. We need to sing it a lot. We need to live it a lot. So stand with me if you would. I'm going to pray. If God leads you to come to pray about anything, pray with these safe people or pray on your own up here, please come. And those of you that aren't coming, would you pray? Father, I pray you do a work in your church. Move as only, only you can. And we'll give you all the credit in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Won't you come as we sing? to Jesus.